Again, I'd like to uh, issue a welcome to all who are joining us tonight for this study of God's Word. We pray His uh, richest blessings upon it, for it has the uh, words of life uh, to impart to us. Before we start, though, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? And Father, <clears throat> we pray that blessings upon us as we engage in the study of Thy Word. We are thankful for the wisdom that it contains for the words of life that it imparts to us. May we be diligent students of thy word to, may we hide it in our hearts that we may not sin. For it is a great blessing to us to have these words, to know that it comes from thee, and that in obedience to, to these words, we have the hope of eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> we're in the uh, uh, of course the book of Romans 8th chapter we'll start verse 23 actually it started 23 last time but there's had some things I wanted to say about it and we're getting a section that's going to be a little complicated so please listen carefully and if we have to go over it again we'll go over it again <clears throat> It says, uh, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now the we and we ourselves, uh, it's, it's a different group from the creation and the whole creation that we talked about before. If all refer to the same thing, then we have reference three times to suffering by the same group. The we, quote unquote, are the ones, not the quote unquote creation or the quote unquote whole creation. It is the we are the ones who have the first fruits of the spirit, quote unquote. Now the we therefore it seem to refer to the apostles uh, but even they are not exempt as, uh, from suffering as has already been noted <clears throat> i have some general thoughts about the uh, <clears throat> five verses that we just covered and you'll have to recall from last week the other four <clears throat> but uh, there have been many explanations of these five verses uh, and they differ from one one another, uh, even among commentators of the Lord's Church. The, the uh, main effort is in determining the meaning and application of the terms, quote unquote, the creation, quote unquote, the first fruits of the Spirit, and quote unquote, we, and quote unquote, we ourselves. Uh, some assume that the creation and the whole creation are the same in extent of meaning and, re and referring to all living things below man. That all living things, both animal and plant, suffer the curse of death along with man. And that they are represented as, as looking forward to the time when the curse of death shall have been removed. And if, if that is uh, metaphorical, then we have to determine what, what is the metaphor. It may be asserted that death uh, came upon flora and fauna alike because of Adam's sin. The thing that kept Adam and Eve alive before they sinned was the fruit of the tree of life. Genesis 3rd chapter verse 22. Now, wisdom and understanding are spoken of uh, metaphorically as a tree of life in Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 13 through 18. We're not going to read that. And so is righteousness in Proverbs 11, chapter, verse 30. Once Adam and Eve sinned, they lost access to this fruit and could not, therefore, physically live forever. 
and it is hardly conceivable that plants and animals were kept alive by the same means. It is therefore unlikely that Paul had in mind the lower creation in this section. It is not unreasonable that he should represent plants and animals as expecting and awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. It is equally unreasonable that he should would affirm that chickens and turnips, sorry, Lynn, uh, would will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's uh, verse 21. Every statement indicates that Paul is talking Yay. about. <laughs> Just a moment. Somebody needs to mute. Thank you. So every statement indicates that Paul is talking about intelligent beings, those who would have a real interest in the resurrection and glorification of the children of God. Now these verses are closely connected with verse 18 and evidently were written to encourage the Christian to endure the suffering that was sure to come for the sake of the glory that shall in time be revealed to us the faithful. <clears throat> so of what comfort is it for us to endure suffering in the knowledge that the lower creation quote unquote will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. <clears throat> Paul speaks of the uh, quote unquote earnest expectation of the creation in verse 19. This earnest expectation of the creation eagerly await, awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. What then is the creation of verses 19 through 21? Who but Christians have this hope? Those that are in rebellion to Christ certainly are not eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. It must be, therefore, that the creation is the church and the Christians that comprise the church. Paul was encouraging Christians to endure suffering. But are Christians either as individuals or as a group ever referred to as a creation? Well, yes, they are. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, Paul wrote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Greek word translated creation in this passage is the same Greek word translated creation in verses 19, 20, 21, 22 here. The church is said to have been created. Paul wrote in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 15, in part it reads, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create, that's the, the verb form of creation, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Jesus created the church, hence it is a creation. The writer of Hebrews speaks of a heavenly creation that is not of this creation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with it. With, it, with hands, that is, not of this creation. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 11. The church is that uh, greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, as opposed to the earthly, that is, of this creation, uh, the earthly tabernacle of the old economy. The things that Paul says of the creation are true of the church, and the Christians making up the church. The word whole in verse, uh, that's W-H-O-L-E, whole in verse 22 modifies creation with uh, creation in that verse coming from the same Greek word translated 
elsewhere is just a creation. The modification causes the word to incorporate all of humanity, not just Christians. Accordingly, all of humanity suffer together, even up to the present time. No one will escape. So what are the first fruits of the Spirit? <clears throat> Some think that this is the same as the indwelling of the Spirit, or guarantee as used in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 22. It says there, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Or in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 5, reads there, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And again in <clears throat> Ephesians, the 1st chapter, verses 13 through 14, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also... Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance <clears throat> until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> Since the we refers to the apostles, the first fruits of the Spirit is unlikely to refer to any indwelling of the Holy Spirit, either personally or representatively. It seems that the first spirit, the first fruits of the spirit conferred on the we are the miraculous gifts of the spirit conferred on the apostles. The word adoption <coughs> is the same as used in uh, verse 15, it's immediately preceding here, and signifies uh, sonship. In becoming a Christian, one is born into the family of God and thus becomes a son of God. Baptism is a spiritual birth. The final resurrection is also portrayed as being another birth. <clears throat> Concerning the body we have in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 chapter verses 40 through 245 and 49 and 53, says there, so also is the res resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall uh, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. For this corruptible was put on incorruption, and this mortal was put on immortality. The divine record has recorded in Philippians, the third chapter, verses 20 through 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to sub subdue all things to himself. In verse 24, chapter 8, <clears throat> it says, Therefore we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Now the word for that begins this verse, uh, that, that relates this passage uh, to the immediately preceding passages. The word saved is transferred, uh, translated are saved in the King James Version. And the verb in the Greek is in the aorist passive indicative tense, which in, indicates that the event happened once. So 
what is this hope? In verse 18, Paul refers to the glory which shall be revealed in us. In verse 19, to the waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. In verse 21, to the deliverance from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. These are all uh, descriptive of future glory. It is this future glory to which our hope is related. When one renders obedience to the gospel and is baptized, all past, past sins are forgiven. And thereafter we walk in newness of life, Romans 6, chapter verse 4, looking forward to the glory that is to come. It is in this hope that we are saved. Hope uh, points to the expectation of a future reality. The faithful Christian has a reasonable expectation of the glory that awaits the saved. Although there is joy in the salvation that one now possesses, even that does not compare with the glory to come. That which is seen indicated, indicate, uh, in, uh, that indicated a present reality, uh, something that is now possessed. If I hope for a new pony, and I can assure you I don't, uh, if I hope for a new pony that I now possess, which I don't, it is a contradiction in terms. I cannot hope for something I already have. The word see is oftentimes used for a reality of possession, enjoyment, suffering, experience. We see pain, see sorrow, see good times, see bad times, and see what the morrow will bring. In verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. Since we do not presently experience the glory of heaven to come, we eagerly wait for it. We desire and expect a glorious future deliverance from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This desire and expectation, that is hope, causes us to persevere during our time of waiting. Paul wrote uh, before in Romans 2nd chapter verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And in Galatians 6 chapter verse 9 he wrote, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In verse 26 of chapter 8, <clears throat> likewise the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. <clears throat> The likewise that begins at first indicates that something else in addition to the Spirit helps us, and that is hope. Uh, beyond agreement on this, the rest of this verse and the next are subject of much uh, discussion. Uh, one line of reasoning by Brother R.L. Whiteside, who is uh, long left the confines of this world, He's, uh, he set this forth uh, in this way. <clears throat> Since the infirmity here mentioned is that we know not how to pray as we ought to pray. What we already know about how to pray, we learn the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And there are urgings and longings in the heart of a sincere child of God that he cannot express. He has a feeling of helplessness or of a deep need without knowing what that need really is or what would meet that need. It is what Paul call, calls groanings which cannot be uttered. 
it is the groanings within us mentioned in verse 23 these groanings are silent groanings unutterable feelings of need the spirit helps us in these groanings for he understands our needs and longings and can make them known to god <clears throat> Now, Brother Guy in Woods was asked this question during an open forum at the Fried Hardeman College Lectures, of course, it's been quite some time ago. And the question was, does not Romans 8, 26 teach that the Holy Spirit exercises an influence upon us which the Word cannot? He answered emphatically, no, and he gave his reasons for answering thusly. And he says, this passage has no bearing whatsoever about how the Holy Spirit indwells or influences the child of God, because when rightly understood, it, it uh, can well be seen that it does not describe any influence of any kind on the child of God at all. Likewise, the Spirit in uh, which I think he uses ASV, but anyway, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with a groaning which cannot be uttered. That's uh, Romans 8, 26. And this is his writing. There are three propositions affirmed by Paul here. Now, number one, the Holy Spirit aids us in our infirmities, which are our weaknesses. Two, we do not know what or how to pray as we ought. And three, the third proposition is that the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He goes on to write, the verb helps describes the Spirit's part in helping us to overcome the weaknesses we all possess in knowing how or what to pray for. And the groanings which the Spirit uses are ours as we labor under life's heavy loads. Strangely, he writes, some assume that the groanings, uh, that's the Greek unutterable sighs, issue from the Holy Spirit. But those who thus do are faced with the insuperable difficulty of explaining why the Spirit should groan or sigh or find difficulty in expressing himself. No, he says, it is not the spirit, but the burdened Christian who groans, and these groans are by the spirit born to our Heavenly Father, and used by the spirit as the instrument of intercession. Thus, uh, the verse uh, following asserts, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And that's the 27th verse of chapter 8, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Uh, Brother Wood goes on to say, we are careful to distinguish between intercession and mediation. Only Christ can mediate for us, uh, 1 Timothy 2 chapter verse 5. But one man may intercede for another at the throne of grace, James 5th chapter verse 16, Genesis 18th chapter verse 22 to 24. God is a great heart searcher. He sees in the mind of the spirit our need. And it is the spirit who takes our sighs, groanings, to God. It will be seen, therefore, that this passage has no relevance to any discussion regarding the manner or mode of the Spirit's indwelling, since it deals with what the Spirit does for us and not to us, and describes an action which occurs in heaven, not on earth, an influence wrought upon God and not upon man. It is a gross perversion of this passage to cite it in support of any theory of indwelling of the Spirit. 
And he says, this view of the passage has been mine for well over a quarter of a century. I was pleased to note in recent years that this was also R.L. Whiteside's view as expressed by him in the annual lesson commentary for 1941, published by the Gospel Advocate Company. I don't happen to have that particular lesson, but I'm sure it's in the, the library, but uh, we've already read what uh, R.L. Whiteside thinks about that. But anyway, uh, R.L. Whiteside wrote in this uh, annual lesson commentary for 1941, he wrote, every man who is devoted to the Lord finds times when deep down in his heart, there are vague desires and longings and a sense of need that he is unable to put into words. These are the groanings which cannot be uttered. These are the groanings which the Holy Spirit conveys to the Father in our prayers. He is the heart searcher. He knows our innermost thoughts and our inexpressible desires and longings. This does not make him the advocate. He makes intercession for us in the sense that he makes uh, known to the Father the things which well up in our hearts, which we cannot express. He does not even help us to express these feelings. Uh, human language is not sufficient for that. In no sense are we to infer that the Spirit causes these unutterable feelings and desires by any direct work on the heart. Rather, it may be said that he interprets these matters to the Father. <clears throat> in this way, he helps us in our ability to express the deepest desires of the heart. <clears throat> now, Franklin Camp, who uh, wrote a book on indwelling the Holy Spirit, has this to say on Romans 8, chapter verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> So the most common interpretation of this, this, these uh, verses is as follows. <clears throat> when a Christian cannot find words to express his petition, the Holy Spirit takes his groanings and intercedes for him to God. He says, I am fully conscious of some of the difficulties of these verses. In dealing with difficult passages, it is always wise not to be dogmatic in rejecting an interpretation that does not violate any other scriptural principle and not be dogmatic in offering an explanation. It is in the spirit that I offer what I think is the meaning of these verses. Uh, before looking at the verses, it is important to see the basis of Paul's discussion. Uh, point one he makes chapter eight is the conclusion of the first division of the Roman letter point two chapter eight is a summary of Paul's conclusions reached uh, as the result of his discussion in the previous chapters point three chapter eight also contains arguments and evidences to establish what the gospel was for both Jew and Gentile. Now this was to answer Judaizing teachers. Point four, Paul's method in the Roman uh, letter was to approach it from the past and develop his theme down to Pentecost and the outgrowth of Pentecost. In this he appealed to the coming of the Spirit in its miraculous manifestations both uh, given to both Jew and Gentile to establish that the gospel was for both. Point five, especially prominent in, in Paul's approach, was a promise to Abraham and its culmination in Christ, <clears throat> with all the spiritual blessings being offered to Jew and Gentile alike in Christ. And the final point uh, is uh, Paul positioned himself back in the Old Testament and looked through the telescope of the Old Testament and saw the development of redemption down through the pages of the Old Testament until it reached its climax in Christ and the gospel. <clears throat> he goes on to say, read the Roman letter and look at the little word now and watch how this word throws the old 
and the New Testaments in the contrast with special emphasis on the law and the gospel. Here is just one example. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And that's uh, from Romans, the third chapter, verses 20 through 21. <clears throat> so the righteousness of what the, uh, which uh, Paul speaks was foreshadowed in the law and the prophets, but could only be realized in Christ and the gospel. And we find that in, uh, again, in the third chapter of Romans, verses 20 through 26. These same truths are still under consideration in chapter 8. Paul's method of approach in the previous part of the book is still his approach in chapter 8. These truths provide the keys to understanding this chapter. <clears throat> he goes on to write, uh, however, is there another possible explanation of Romans 8, chapter verse 26 and 27 than the previous one mentioned? He says, I believe there's another interpretation that harmonizes with the general teaching of the Bible and also the context of Romans chapter 8. My study of the scriptures established the fact that it was the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal the mind of God to man through selected men and to confirm the revelation as a genuine revelation from God. Numerous passages uh, make this point clear. Following a man's sin and separation from God, it was necessary for God to reveal his word to man, or man would never have known God's will. But the revelation of God's will calls for a supernatural revelation. A supernatural revelation made it necessary for those who received the revelation to have proper cred uh, credentials to avoid counterfeit and deception. This accounts for the direct operation of the Spirit in revelation and confirmation. Because the gospel was to be preached to the whole world, miraculous gifts were given not only to the apostles to receive the revelation and confirmation of the gospel, but also to churches who had spiritual gifts. An additional uh, additional purpose of a church receiving spiritual gifts, especially the Gentile churches, was to establish the fact that Gentiles were acceptable to God just as the Jews. If Romans 8, chapter verse 26 and 27 meant that the Spirit takes the groanings of the Christian and makes them known to God, this is a direct reversal of the general work of the Spirit in revealing the mind of God to man. He goes on to say, I can understand why it was necessary for the Spirit to reveal the mind of God to man, but it's a, it's a little difficult for me to understand why God needs the Spirit to interpret man's needs to him. Of course, the fact that I cannot understand something does not mean that it is not so. While on the other hand, if an interpretation, interpretation can be offered that Harmonized with the general teaching of the Bible and the context in which it is found, context in which it is found, it seemed to me to be more reasonable to at least consider the interpretation. There is, he goes on right. There is still another problem with the explanation that these verses teach that the Spirit takes the groanings of the Christian and interprets them to God today. If this is true, then in, then this work of the Spirit is confined to the Christian age, there is not the slightest indication that the Spirit did this either in the patriarchal, patriarchal or the Jewish age. But there were people who had burdens before the Christian age. There were those who groaned under, the, under the, their burdens before the Christian age. There are those who prayed under such burdens before the Christian age. For example, uh, Thayer, on page 587, of course, I have that on, on computer, so I don't get pages. Uh, on page 587, the word groaning gives uh, 
Romans 8 chapter verse 26 in Acts 7 chapter verse 34 together. Uh, Acts 7 34 is a reference to Israel in Egyptian bondage. They groaned. God heard their groanings. The Holy Spirit did not take their groanings and interpret them to God. If God could hear the groanings of the Israelites while they were in Egyptian bondage without the Holy Spirit interpreting their prayers to him, why may not God likewise hear the groanings of Christians today? <clears throat> Is there an explanation that harmonizes with the general teaching of the scriptures that it was the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal and confirm the word of God? In the apostolic age, there was inspired prayer. And we'll uh, get into that later in chapter 11. Just as the Holy Spirit revealed the mind of God for instruction, the Holy Spirit also revealed prayer. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 14, chapter verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. The tongue was a gift. We find that in 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 10. If one spoke in a tongue, it was by a direct revelation. A prayer in a tongue was an inspired prayer, but inspired inspired prayer was not limited uh, to the one that had the gift of tongues. Paul only mentions this type of inspired prayer in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because he was uh, discussing there the abuse of tongues. A commentary on this type of prayer is found in Jude 19 and 20. Verse 19 speaks of uninspired teachers, sensual, uh, animal or fleshly, uh, sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Then verse 20 says, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit was praying by the inspiration of the Spirit, just as the one of 1 Corinthians 14 that prayed in the tongue, prayed by inspiration, so the one of Jude 20 that prayed in the Holy Spirit, prayed an inspired prayer. I think there is also additional evidence to, to support this fact. <clears throat> in John, the 14th chapter, verse 15 and 16, Christ promised the apostles the Holy Spirit as a comforter. I have already discussed this in the previous chapter, and you have to go to this book to look at that previous chapter. Uh, but the word that is translated comforter is broader than uh, our word, English word, comforter. Vine gives the following, then generally one who pleads another's cause, an intercessor advocate. Now consider the following. <clears throat> we make seven points. One, the promise of the comforter to the apostles was the miraculous gift of the Spirit to equip them for their work as apostles. Item 2, included in the meaning of the word, according to the divine, was that of an intercessor. Point 3, this promise of the Holy Spirit to the apostles as an intercessor would be in connection with their work of receiving and confirming revelation. This involves the miraculous work of the Spirit. Point 4, the Holy Spirit inspired prayer 1 Corinthians 14 14 and Jude 20 which we read and this was a revelation it was a revelation of prayer and the revelation of the prayer was the spirit's intercession point five this harmonizes with the work of the Holy Spirit in giving and confirming revelation point six if an inspired sermon was a revelation given by the spirit why would not an inspired prayer and be a revelation of the Spirit, not be a revelation of the Spirit. Point seven, an inspired prayer harmonizes with the general teaching of the Bible that the work of the Spirit was revelation and confirmation. Now, Vian has the following comment on the uh, work, uh, word uh, intercession. The verb signifies to fall in with a person, to draw near so as to converse familiarly Hence, it is not properly intercession in the accepted sense of that term, but rather approach to God in free and familiar prayer. 
intercession in the passage cited is not to make intercession but to intervene interfere thus in romans 8 26 it is not the spirit that pleads on the behalf but that he throws himself into our case takes part in it this is exactly how the, <clears throat> brother uh, camp goes on to say this is exactly what the spirit did in in, in in an inspired prayer in revealing the prayer he threw himself into it took part in it this interpretation at least harmonizes with the work of the holy spirit in revealing god's will i think for the more that it also harmonizes with the general teaching of the roman letter which included a discussion of spiritual gifts since this interpretation at least harmonizes with the general work of the Spirit in revealing God's will, it seems to me that at least it deserves some consideration. This uh, quotation by uh, Campbell in a previous chapter, and you have to look at his book, uh, pointed out that the entire assemblies were under the direction of the Spirit by the spiritual gifts in the church. All the epistles to the churches were to Gentile churches. This accounts for the numerous statements concerning spiritual gifts to these churches and the instruction uh, for the use of spiritual gifts. While McKnight, and again you have to look at his book, while McKnight does not give this as his interpretation of Romans 8.26, he admits it is a possible interpretation. Perhaps the apostle meant that the spirit, this is McKnight talking, Perhaps the apostle meant that the Spirit helped their infirmities by inspiring them with a proper prayer. That's the end of his quote. And then he cites 1 Corinthians 14, 15 as an explanation, which verse is a reference to an inspired prayer that is that was not in a tongue. This interpretation harmonizes with the work of the Spirit in revelation and confirmation. In inspiring the prayer, the Holy Spirit was making known the mind of God to man, this passage, like the other verses, should be studied in the context of the apostolic age when the Spirit worked directly and miraculously. And that is the end of his quote. And since we're a little bit over time, we're going to stop here and we'll begin with verse 27 of Romans 8 next week. Thank you.